Hey everybody, it's Kevin right here from Bitcoin for Beginners. And so I finally took some time to do some research into Ripple to figure out exactly how it works. So today I want to share with you my findings about how Ripple works, go through a bunch of examples, and finally top it all off with a discussion on whether or not Ripple is centralized, and if so, to what extent. So the reason I really wanted to dive into Ripple is because it has been hot lately. In 2017, there was a roughly 34,000% increase from the start of the year to the end of the year. Especially in the past two months, it went from 22 cents to roughly $3 at the highest point. And so this rapid increase really caught everyone's attention. If you're in various crypto communities, the buzz would have been undeniable. And furthermore, the company isn't just idle. They're constantly putting out news and updates lately. They've had Asian banks testing out the Ripple network with various pilot programs, and also they recently announced a large partnership with MoneyGram. So the purpose of Ripple is to be a global system of mutual settlements, designed primarily for financial institutions like banks. This is why you commonly hear people call Ripple the bank coin. Here's what it can do. One, real-time gross settlement. This is a way of transferring funds from bank to bank that is real-time, one-to-one, not bundled together, and final. Two, it can do currency exchange between different fiat currencies around the world. Three, it can handle remittances, which is a way of sending money overseas. So here's how it works. Basically, a network of nodes maintains a ledger based on an open source protocol. And this ledger records balances and other information, kind of like Bitcoin does. But each transaction requires two parties. One, a regulated financial institution that manages funds for customers, and two, a market maker or liquidity provider, which I'll be referring to as LP, for various currencies. And there's two different payment methods when you want to send transactions to different people in the Ripple network. One is XRP, their native token, and two is IOUs. We will cover these in more detail in the coming slides. But basically both happen on the same ledger. They both take around roughly four seconds or so to settle, and they're cost efficient compared to legacy systems. So first, let's take a look at IOUs. These are tokens issued on the Ripple platform that can be redeemed for a fungible asset, for example, USD or gold. Anyone can issue these IOUs, but if you want to accept them, you have to trust that the issuer will redeem these IOUs for their underlying assets. Here's a real-world example to make things potentially more clear for you. Kevin wants to pay Adrian $10 in IOUs. They trust each other, so that's cool. Now Adrian goes on to buy something from Steven for $5. Steven also trusts Kevin, so Adrian sends this $5 in his IOUs that he has for payment to Steven. Now Kevin owes Steven $5 and Adrian $5, and Adrian and Steven are now even. So they're passing along IOUs pretty much. But there's a problem you might realize, and that's the fact that they may not always share a trusted issuer of IOUs. So like, it's just convenient that Steven and Adrian both trust me, Kevin, so that they can pass the IOUs along to each other. But if that's not the case, then the Ripple algorithm will establish a line of trust to connect the initial debtor to initial creditor. So there's going to be a chain of intermediaries that trust their neighbors, and so the balances are automatically adjusted down the line so that it's all even. Kind of like we said for the simpler example with Steven, Adrian, and Kevin. Here's another high-level example. ABC Corp from the USA needs to pay XYZ Corp in Germany 100 euros. Their banks are going to rely on a third-party LP to help them with the transfer. So the LP pre-funds banks with the local currency from both sides. The banks create segregated Ripple accounts, and those balances are tracked on the ILP ledger. The LP moves funds into those segregated Ripple accounts, and then posts a foreign exchange quote to ABC's bank, 1.412 euros per USD, for example. ABC Corporation is shown the cost of fees and the conversion rate and decide whether or not they want to accept this. If they do, both banks put the funds and the fees on hold and provide cryptographic receipt to the validator. This validator checks that both banks have the funds on hold and then releases the funds on the ledger simultaneously. Once the ledger is settled, XYZ's German bank collects the fee and then posts that 100 euros to the XYZ's bank account. And then ABC receives payment confirmation and everything's good. This is just a simple example on how the Ripple network can be used by two corporations 
to send money overseas. So up to this point, I have not yet mentioned the XRP token and how this fits into the whole process. This is the native digital currency in the Ripple network. So organizations need to hold XRP or buy it from a liquidity provider when they want to make a transaction. They send XRP to the recipient just like they would any other crypto transaction. However, only fiat transfer occurs between the bank and the domestic liquidity provider. So using XRP can help them avoid risk that other parties won't pay their IOUs, which is called counterparty risk. Because remember, IOUs are cool and all, but they require you to trust that they can be redeemed at any time from the person who issues them. It can also be used as a bridge currency when there's no direct exchange available between two separate currencies. Also, it's important to note that each trade in the Ripple network requires a transaction fee that you can pay with XRP, and also each account in the Ripple network is required to reserve 20 XRP. This was built into the process for anti-spam purposes, and that used to be cheap, but now it's kind of expensive. Here's just a high-level diagram on how a sending bank in Mexico can send money to a Korean bank by going through XRP as a middleman bridge currency. So let's take a look at some major features in the Ripple ecosystem. One is the gateway. This is the entity that enables users to interact with the Ripple liquidity pool. They accept deposits from users and issues balances on the ledger. They also usually have KYC AML policies. This is know your customer anti-money laundering. And some famous gateways are like Bitstamp, GitHub, Ripple Fox, etc. Users must extend trust to these gateways that hold their deposit. Two, there's a consensus ledger, which is a distributed database storing info about all Ripple accounts. And there's also a network of independent validating servers, over 55 of them at this point. And they all come together to decide on the accepted ledger based on a distributed consensus protocol. There are multiple rounds that go on in this process until supermajority is reached. There's also Forex and payments, which is a major feature of Ripple. They can swap currencies in three to five seconds, and they can jump from USD directly to Japanese yen, or maybe the best route is from USD to Great Britain pound, the Canadian dollars, to Ripple, and finally to Japanese yen. The pathfinding algorithm automatically optimizes for the cost to the user. And finally, market makers are also really important. This can be anyone, but it's usually hedge funds or other currency trading desks. They just need to hold balances in multiple currencies and connect to multiple gateways to be considered a market maker. Their job is to facilitate payments between users where no direct trust exists. The more there are, the better it is for the Ripple network to operate. So some of you have been waiting for this moment. We want to ask the big question, the elephant in the room, is Ripple centralized? So upon creation, there were 100 billion Ripples straight up and 80 billions was assigned to Ripple Labs and a lot of that to the founders. So this is why a lot of people say it's centralized. Such a large proportion is controlled by the company behind it. But recently, they placed 55 billion into escrow and they're releasing 1 billion each month for use, 55 months in duration. Another reason is because this is made for banks. So because banks are their major customers, they need to have regulations in place. One of these is a freeze feature. More on this next. But it's also fair to mention that the Ripple network and open source protocol can still operate without the company. So this balance freeze feature, gateways can use this feature unless they decide to opt out. The purpose is quote, to freeze individual accounts issuances in order to investigate suspicious activity. Once again, going back to these regulations for banks. So they can freeze funds to a particular user and it may only be sent back to the gateway that issued them. There's also a global freeze feature, freeze all balances issued by a gateway. It's also fair to mention that this does not affect the XRP in your personal wallet like your Ledger Nano S, only ones that are in gateways. So you may be wondering if it's ever been used before, and the answer is yes. In 2015, relatively early on, when Ripple decided to lock up former co-founder Jed McCaleb's funds when he tried to cash out more than he promised to, or so that's how the reporting goes. So to be honest, after taking a look at Ripple, it was really interesting. It seems like a solid company to me, solving a really important problem. I would probably buy their company stock if it was publicly traded. However, XRP and the Ripple network are very different compared to truly decentralized cryptocurrencies or P2P digital cash systems like Bitcoin, Litecoin, etc. But what if we viewed it as a utility token instead of a digital currency? Maybe its centralization would feel a little less awful? Who knows? 
So once again, do you have any questions or comments? Please give me a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I would greatly appreciate it if you share the word with your friends and your fellow cryptocurrency communities. Tell them about this channel. Share my videos with them. That would help me a lot to create more content that's informative for you guys. Thank you very much, and I am out.